All right, you guys, this episode of Paradigm Media News is a profile on death row, gang wars, and the Fresno Bulldogs. In 1999, a Fresno couple decided to go out for the evening, and this day started out like any other normal day. But this day would end up being different, and in fact, it would change both of their lives forever. First, they decided that they would go out to watch a movie, and then they'd go have dinner at one of their favorite restaurants, the Doghouse Grill. The couple decided to go see The Matrix, which had just been released in theaters. Just like any other young couple, they bought popcorn, candy, and sodas, and then they sat there intensely watching this major motion picture. When the movie ended, they got up, threw away their garbage, and headed for the exit. As the young couple, both in their 20s, exited the Edwards Cinema on North Blackstone Avenue, they were accosted by a man with a knife. The woman was forced into the back seat, and her companion was ordered to drive to an ATM, where he took money out and handed it to the kidnapper. Instead of releasing the couple, he forced them to drive to several other ATMs, but they were unable to withdraw any more money. The male victim said his mother would give them money, so they drove to her apartment in Clovis. While the son went inside, the robber held the woman hostage in the car. The mother telephoned Clovis police while her boyfriend, driving his own car, agreed to lead the robber and hostages to an ATM in Clovis where officers surrounded the bank and arrested Galvin. Galvin was then transported to the Fresno County Jail without further incident and was formally charged with two counts of attempted robbery and two counts of kidnapping. During his trial, Galvin attacked his attorney and ultimately decided to represent himself. The young couple testified against Galvin at his trial and he was eventually found guilty and given life in prison. After he was sentenced to life in prison, Galvin was eventually transferred to Corcoran State Prison where he killed his cellmate, Robert Johnson. The prosecutor in that case, Tom Snyder, said that Galvin killed his cellmate, Robert Johnson, 28 of Clear Lake, in September 2010 by getting him drunk on inmate-made wine, then slitting his throat, strangling him with an electric cord, then smashing his head against a concrete bed several times. Johnson was 30 days away from his release. They shared a cell in a high-security housing unit. Galvin told investigators that he killed Johnson because his cellmate had disrespected him by calling him stupid and that he was punishing Johnson for violating an unwritten rule not to complain to guards about disputes with cellmates. After attacking his public defender in 2011 and breaking his nose, Galvin served as his own lawyer. In July, while being taken back to Corcoran State Prison, from court in Hanford, he slipped out of his handcuffs and stabbed a guard five times with an inmate made weapon. Galvin was in Corcoran serving four consecutive life terms. Two were from the 1999 kidnapping, robbery, and ransom, when an evening at the movies turned into a night of terror for a young couple who were carjacked outside a Fresno theater. While still in the Fresno County Jail, Galvin attacked a correctional officer for which he had got his third life sentence. The fourth life sentence came from assaulting another inmate with a weapon at Salinas Valley State Prison. He's the absolute poster boy for the death penalty, Snyder said in March. A man convicted of murdering his cellmate is now facing the death penalty. Jurors decided the fate of Robert Galvin, 37, after just 30 minutes of deliberation. Their decision marked the end of a trial that lasted almost four weeks. Galvin was the sole suspect in the murder of Robert Johnson, 29, who was found dead in their shared cell at the California State Prison Corcoran on September 16, 2010. The jury found Galvin guilty of first degree murder with special circumstances of torture and lying in wait and assault with a deadly weapon by a prisoner causing death. Today, Galvin sits on death row at San Quentin State Prison. He openly touts his status as an inactive Fresno Bulldog and asserts openly that Norteños and Sureños are his arch enemies. Galvin can often be seen outside in the dog kennels, no pun intended, small individual cages used to isolate inmates when they come out for their exercise time. He's a cell soldier, dude's a bitch. He comes out here and talks shit all day because he knows nobody can get to him, said one inmate who chose not to be identified 
Galvin is from Fresno, California and claims to have had strong ties with the Fresno Bulldogs or the F-14ers. Although Fresno is located in Northern California and is technically on the geographical side of Bakersfield that Northaniels claim is their rightful recruiting grounds, the Fresno Bulldogs are considered to be fierce rivals with other Northaniels in Northern California. In fact, the Fresno Bulldogs are also considered to be fierce rivals with the Sureños as well. Before the evolution of the North-South split and before the geographical lines were drawn, Northaniels from Fresno, California were like any other Northaniels from some of the bigger cities. In fact, Fresno was actually one of the bigger cars and produced a lot of manpower for the Nuestra Familia and the Northaniel movement. I remember when the homeboys from Fresno were still with us back in the late 70s and early 80s. We were fucking hella deep, said one former Northaniel gang member who chose not to be identified. Believe it or not, the Fresno split was credited to one individual, Eddie Crackers Vindiola, who at one time was a high ranking member of the Nuestra Familia. Crackers was considered to be one of the NF's most dedicated and one of the most loyalist members back in the 60s and 70s. He was also one of the highest ranking members who was not only part of the organizational governing body, but he also participated in the stabbing and killing of Rudy Cheyenne Cadena. Due to internal conflict and differences that Crackers was personally involved in, he would later find himself in a situation where his loyalty to one of his closest homeboys from his neighborhood would be pitted against his loyalty to the Nuestra Familia. In 1980, as NF's new leadership began to take shape, an NF lieutenant named Flacco from Fresno, who had chosen to side with Babo Sosa after Sosa was impeached, was much sought after. He was considered a primary target, not only because of his status in the organization, but because he was close friends with Sosa. Since Flacco was a longtime member who had portrayed himself as dedicated to NF and his principles, most NF's remaining members who didn't side with Salsa thought he wanted to return and function amongst the rank and file of NF's new leadership. The new leadership offered Flacco the opportunity to re-enter the gang under one condition, that he hit Salsa. Flacco refused, which in turn made him, in the eyes of the leaders, that much more of a threat to the gang's safety and security. Within a week of his refusal, NF's new leaders decided to have him hit, which would make the statement that the NF wasn't going to allow Sosa or any of those he sided with off the hook. Eddie's Crackers Vindiola, who was also a high-ranking NF member at the time, was then ordered to hit Flacco. He too refused, and instead of hitting Flacco, was overheard warning him that he was in danger of being hit. It was said that Flacco and Crackers were good friends for a number of years and that Crackers chose his homeboy over his NF obligations. It didn't take long before a willing NF member ended up hitting Crackers. After Crackers was hit, his ties with the NF were officially cut and he became a renegade. Crackers, along with Flacco, started their own gang. This new prison gang was made by and for the Latino inmates from Fresno and eventually became known as the F-14ers who don't side with anyone but their homeboys from Fresno. F-14ers are the sworn enemies of the Nuestra Familia. Because of the unparalleled influence that Crackers and Flacco had in Fresno, amongst some of the bigger street gangs out there, these two single-handedly were able to create a split and thus the birth of a new gang that they had envisioned called the Fresno Bulldogs was born. In 1991, Northerners from Fresno were still programming on the yard with the rest of the Northaniel Collective. The split that Crackers and Flacco created was evolving, but it was still in the beginning stages. Northaniels from Fresno had begun to separate themselves from the rest of the Northaniels and had begun to openly declare themselves as a separate individual entity. Whenever a conflict would arise on the yard between Northaniels and some of the other group segments, Fresno would eliminate itself and declare its position as being neutral. In the beginning, this created a lot of confusion and it put the Northaniel Collective in a contentious position. Northaniels always had to come to terms with the fact that they were a minority in prison. CDC controlled the numbers and they based the population margins on several factors. One factor CDC employed was by attempting to distribute an even amount of inmates who belonged to different groups. 
This was done by allocating so many beds to the northerners, so many to the southerners, so many to the Crips, so many to the Bloods, and so many to the Whites. This somewhat controlled the numbers, but the dilemma that the Norteños now realized that they were facing was that CDC didn't recognize the split that was evolving between the northerners and the Fresno car. This meant that the northerners would become even more of a minority and that their numbers would be shredded up even more. A couple years later, around 1994, it was then decided that anyone from Fresno who identified with either being a Bulldog or an F-14er from Fresno had to go. Not only were they considered dead weight, but they were counterproductive insofar as the numbers and the war that was escalating with the Southerners. For this same reason, this is why Northerners are usually skeptical about allowing Christians from Northern California to remain on the yards unless they're not assigned to Northern Hispanic beds. Henceforth, Fresno became an enemy when they announced that they no longer wished to fall under the dictates of the Nuestra Familia or the Nuestra Raza and chose to function independently. Crackers and Flaco used their influence in Fresno to turn the entire county of Fresno away from the NF's following. They engineered this by uniting the four main barrios in Fresno together. Eastside, Parkside, Sunset, and Pinedale became the nucleus of F-14. Later, F-14 would morph into the Fresno Bulldogs, who were anti-NF and who became arch enemies with the NF. Some of the more notable members from Fresno with influence were Richard Canicas Aguilar, Gilbert Happy Ambalong, Sam Smiley Estrada, Carlos Payaso Gonzalez, Jimmy Kakui Gutierrez, Roy Indio Rodriguez, Carlos Casper Silva, Johnny, Johnny Boy Stankowitz, Ruben Loco Garcia, Danny Big Nose Gonzalez, Ruben the Duke Ceja, and Frank Sleepy Villagrana. These individuals, who were all loyal to Flacco and Crackers, used their influence to spread the F-14 Fresno Bulldog philosophy. Crackers also had a big family and a number of brothers who were also influential and looked up to in Fresno. This split has lasted for almost a quarter century now, and the animus has only grown deeper. In or around 1998, the F-14ers attempted to forge an alliance with the Mexican Mafia. F-14ers and Sureños were actually selling up together in Pelican Bay. When I was housed in D7 in 1998, there was a Sureño and a Bulldog sold up together in my pod. I had heard about this loose alliance between the Bulldogs and the Sureños, but actually seeing it was awkward. It also made the interaction in the pod a little awkward too. Because common courtesy and respect was extended to the Mexican Mafia, the Sureños, and the white inmates, but Bulldogs and those that were claiming to be F-14ers were basically excommunicated or were on dead cell status. This was being perpetrated on their accord, so the dynamics were a little different when it came to them. The loose-knit alliance eventually fell apart due to sporadic conflicts ignited between the Sureños and the Bulldogs, and by 2000, there was no more of them sold up. Now, the Bulldogs not only became on-site targets by the Nuestra Familia and the Norteños, but also by the Mexican Mafia and the Sureños. As of this writing, the Bulldogs can no longer walk the main lines and are rushed on-site by whoever gets them first. As far as Phantom on death row, I've personally seen this individual on numerous occasions walking by the dog kennels on my way to the yard. The Northern Hispanic BGF yard, which is known as the Six Yard, used to be ran behind East Block, all the way at the end of the death row yards. I can't remember exactly when they changed it, but sometime between 2000 and 2005, they built two big yards and a bunch of dog kennels, small individual yards that are used for walk-alone inmates, out in front of East Block on the upper yard. This is where they started running our yards from that point on. Whenever we'd walk by to go out to the six yard, Phantom would usually be out there in one of those dog kennels talking shit and bumping his gums. I know to the average person that he probably appears to be a menacing and intimidating type of dude, but to convicts or other guys who are used to being around guys like him, he's harmless. 90% of the guys in prison are covered in ink like him. It's a trend that you see everywhere. Even the COs are blasted back. I'm not bashing on the dude, but contrary to how he might look, he's a little guy too. As far as the trash talking he used to do, this was all unprovoked. None of the active northerners would ever feed into it or say anything to him. 
He was doing this because he was trying to push the bulldog politics. Besides Phantom, there was another individual by the name of Johnny Johnny Boy Avila from Fresno who used to conduct himself the same way. He's been on death row since the mid 90s. As a matter of fact, he was assigned to the same yard as Tookie and Dennis Big Hurt Brewer on the one yard. Whenever we used to walk by the one yard in the old yards behind East Block, he'd be right there on the gate trying to mean mug and get into a verbal fist fight with anyone who'd give him that kind of attention. Talking shit seemed to be a way for him to entertain himself, so I remember personally giving the northerners a directive back then not to respond or engage with them. The inserted picture of him above looks nothing like he did back in the mid 90s when he first landed on death row. He's aged significantly. Considering the type of case this guy caught his DP case for, I never got why he felt so entitled to run his mouth. But then again, contrary to how most of us feel about someone who catches a double murder rape case, maybe he felt like this made him tough. At any rate, his problems began one night between the hours of July 31st and August 1st of 1991. Johnny Johnny Boy Avila Jr., a member of the Parkside Bulldogs gang, was apparently among three men that were convicted in 1994 of two counts of first degree murder in the slayings of two young women three years earlier. His co-defendants, Richard Avila, who was Johnny's cousin, and Jeffrey Spaulding, received sentences of life in prison without the possibility of parole. On the night of the incident, two young women, Dorothy Medina, and Arlene Sanchez attended a gathering in rural Fresno where Medina was brutally gang raped. After the rape, Medina and Sanchez were then driven to a canal bank and killed. The bodies were found the following day, but Avila, his cousin and Spradlin were subsequently arrested and charged due to eyewitnesses seeing them leave the area where the bodies were dumped and due to the statements others made who had knowledge of the crime. Three individuals testified against the defendants and basically became the prosecution's case in chief. According to Michael Rojas, Ray Juarez, and Frank Rodriguez, 30 people gathered at 1604 North Hayes in Fresno in expectation of a drive-by shooting. A number of firearms were brought to that location and some of the individuals were armed. The witnesses claimed that everybody was drinking beer, smoking weed, and getting high on PCP. At some point, Dorothy Medina and Arlene Sanchez arrived at the gathering. After several hours, Johnny Boy, Spradlin, and one of the other testifying witnesses, Frank Rodriguez, drove the two women in a late model gray Pontiac Bonneville, returning later without them. According to all three of the witnesses, the women were brought out to the wilderness where they were given PCP. When the two women were so high on PCP that they could no longer defend themselves, they were raped and then killed to eliminate any witnesses. Both of Johnny Boy's co-defendants will inevitably die in prison for the crimes that they participated in. But the irony in all this is that Johnny Boy will never see the state of California carry out his death penalty sentence. His reprieve came in the form of COVID-19. Condemned to death for one of the most notorious murder cases of the 90s, he died at San Quentin State Prison on Sunday from suspected coronavirus complications. Depending on who you are or how you look at it, this was either a blessing or an unfortunate circumstance. Today, Fresno remains at odds with both the NF and the MA, while the NF and MA seem to be locked into an unwavering peace treaty. I personally don't foresee anything changing insofar as the political position that Fresno or any of its adversaries have taken. Prior to this nationwide pandemic, CDCR was forcing the issue by merging some of the lower level yards to program together. This was a pilot program and was still in the trial stages, but they were putting the level one and level two yards together and they were being converted into what were being called 50-50 yards. Right now, COVID has everything at a standstill, but there's no doubt in my mind that the conflict with Fresno will reignite as soon as they open these yards back up again. When I was still active, I thought that it was an unfortunate thing that we had that split with Fresno. There's no denying the fact that it made the Northeno Collective weaker and that it made them weaker standing alone when they called for their independence. There is still Northeños from Fresno who refuse to buy into the F-14 propaganda and who still choose to function as Northeños. I was settled up with one in Susanville years ago when that split was just coming to a head. His name was Anthony Weasel Trujillo. 
He was a good dude and being settled up with him gave me a chance to gain a more in-depth understanding about how Norteños are brainwashed into becoming F-14ers. He was a straight rider though. At the time, we were going through a good six month period where the administration was putting Fresno Bulldogs out there on the exercise yard with us and we were literally taking turns hitting them. It always played out the same way unless they were being straight up about their affiliation. For those that tried coming out and acting like they weren't riding with the Bulldogs, we'd let them come out, then we'd play this slow cat and mouse game with them, asking them whether or not they were Bulldogs. And then, whose ever turn it was, would stab them. We already knew their whole background history prior to going out to the yard, but we'd still play along with them until it was time to remove them. For those who were upfront about their affiliations with the Bulldogs, it would literally be on at the yard gate as soon as we went out. So a lot of time, I used to race with my neighbors to see who could get out and get paid first. When they came to strip us out, we used to fly through the routine and get dressed as fast as we could so we could get cuffed up and get out there first. Whoever was the fastest got to go out and get off. That just goes to show you how young and how stupid I was back then. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this short profile on Phantom, the Fresno Bulldogs, and some of the politics that caused the division. In the very near future, Paradigm Media News is going to be running a more detailed spill on Fresno and how the division started.